Welcome back to another episode of Swamp Stories. For this episode, we finally head back to the East Coast. There, we cover some important history that nobody knows about. But despite the lack of publicity, this is a major problem that New York has to deal with. So get ready because this is a good one. But before we get into it, make sure to leave a like and subscribe if you're new. You can also follow the Instagram page as well. So let's get into it. We start off about a thousand miles southeast of the United States in the beautiful Dominican Republic. As many of us know, the island was colonized half by the French and half by the Spanish. Well, in 1804, Haiti gained its independence from France and became its own nation. And directly after this occurred, Haiti itself colonized the Dominican Republic. Kind of. This lasted until 1844 when the Dominicans revolted. The revolt was led by three men, Juan Duarte, Matias Mea, and Francisco Sanchez. Together, the three are known as the Trinitarios, a term that Dominicans hold dearly. Well, over the years, the Dominican Republic became a melting pot of three cultures. And after decades of mixing, the population created their own cultural identity. The country has always had a strong culture and extreme pride. On top of this, the weather is great the beaches are beautiful and the women okay let me stay in my lane but despite all of these great attributes the dominican republic has had a lot of issues as well political and economic struggles have made life on the island extremely difficult for a long time so despite the love they have for their country many started to leave in the 1970s between 1978 and 1982 170,000 dominicans immigrated to the united states and 155,000 of them ended up up in New York City. Many of these people came over with no money, didn't speak English, and had very little formal education. So because of this, the majority of Dominicans settled in the Bronx in the 1980s. And if you know anything about the Bronx in the 80s, not a place you would ever want to roll through. The Bronx was extremely rough and not very welcoming to newcomers to say the least. So upon arrival, many Dominicans were pestered at school and on the streets. This environment forced many to take a different route than what their parents had planned for. And that introduces us to two young men. Leonida Sierra, also known as Junito, and Julio Marin, also known as Caballo. The two men came to America as young teenagers and lived in the rough projects of the Bronx. There, the teens had to fight every day to gain respect for themselves. And because of this, they both spiraled into the street life by 1988. And in 1989, both were arrested for separate homicides in the Bronx. Junito received 221 years and Caballo got a life sentence as well. At a young age, their life Life in the Bronx was already over, but now they had to fight for their respect once again. Inside of Rikers Island, the Dominicans were severely outnumbered by everyone else, and because of this, they were at a major disadvantage. So in 1992, Caballo and Junito came up with a plan, a plan to unify all of the Dominicans in Rikers Island. They admired the original Trinitarios of the Dominican Republic, so much so that they adopted their strategies and took their name as well. Junito and Caballo were charismatic leaders, so by 1993 there were over 100 Trinitarios in Rikers Island. Quickly, they gained a reputation of being the wildest and most reckless in the system. And over the years, as members were released back into society, the Trinitarios spread throughout the streets of New York City. The two leaders wanted members to take over entire neighborhoods of the Bronx and Queens as well. So starting in 1994, Trinitario members hit the streets hard. They went through the Bronx and Queens taking over block by block. And of course, this strategy caused rivalries all around them. The leaders stood for total domination and only had one big rule. When a Trinitario bleeds, we all bleed. And this leads to reckless acts that many members don't really want to commit. And it also led to the Trinitarios being the most hated in New York City by the year 2000. In just six years, they had dozens of rivals and only one alliance left. This would be Dominicans Don't Play, also known as DDP. They were established a couple years before the Trinitarios and are headquartered in Washington Heights. The area was defined as DDP territory and everyone knew it, so only a fool would try to take this area over. Well, for whatever reason, the Trinitarios wanted Washington Heights as well, and this ruined their relationship forever. By the start of 2001, DDP and the Trinitarios were full-on rivals. So at this point, the Trinitarios no longer have any allies in the game, and the us-against-the-world mentality caused a snowball effect as well. 
everyone wanted to test the Trinitarios, partly because they wore lime green, but also because of their reputation that spread throughout the area. And that takes us to their first national story. Due to gentrification, many Dominicans left New York City in the early 2000s. Some went to Yonkers, some went to Long Island, and others went across the river to New Jersey. And with these moves, people brought their affiliations with them into uncharted territory. And for a Trinitario named Luis Arias, that meant representing his colors in West New York, New Jersey. The small area is represented by a group of guys who call themselves 60th Street. Within the first month, they pestered Luis and a member named Munji even jumped him. Of course, these guys had no idea who they were messing with. So the next time Luis returned to the Bronx, he told his friends about what had transpired. They were infuriated, so the Bronx Trinitarios came up with a plan. The upcoming Sunday would be the annual Dominican Day Parade. The annual celebration takes place on the second Sunday of August and honors Dominican independence. There's one in the Bronx, Manhattan, and West New York. Typically, New Yorkers aren't going to New Jersey for fun or willingly for any reason, especially on a festive day like this. But for the Bronx Trinitarios, it's a perfect opportunity to make a statement in West New York. So Alex Colon, Pablo Molino, and Pedro Quesada head over the bridge at 6 p.m. They wait for the parade to calm down and spectators to leave the scene. Then they go looking for 60th Street members. They drive around each block looking carefully until they spot two guys who may be associated. So they get out of the car and approach one of the men named Jarmer Brown. They ask him, do you know Munji? To which he responds, yeah, why? They tell him that they need to find him. To which Jarmer responds, if you want him, you have to see me first. The three Trinitarios do not like the response, so they unfortunately make a terrible decision. Bam. Thankfully, Jarmer's friend Christopher Navarro would testify and all three men would get life sentences. This was New Jersey's introduction to the Trinitarios, who would later spread throughout the region. But for now, we stay in New York City. Incidents like this kept occurring all over the metro area. The guys in Lime Green taking small incidents way too far. And interestingly enough, it wasn't just guys. In 2003, a woman named Maria Meja started the female faction of the Trinitarios, known as the Bad Barbies. Maria was a young, attractive brunette who always painted her nails black. Unlike the rest of the Trinitarios, Maria did not identify herself with colors, flags, or even tattoos. Instead, she tried to remain as regular and unintimidating as possible. That's because her strategy was to deceive rivals and even be used as a tool to set them up. And for this reason, the Bad Barbies Barbies were the most dangerous faction of the Trinitarios, and that's from NYPD. Well, Maria's first test would come in March of 2005. Earlier in the month, the Trinitarios lost a beloved member named Gil Lanier in the Bronx. So to get revenge, the Bronx Trinitarios called up Maria Mea. They wanted her to lead them to arrival on the DDP side. March 11th, 2005. Maria meets up with a man named Miguel Perez and takes him to a Mexican restaurant in the Bronx. After eating with him, they leave the restaurant and go their separate ways. And that's when a group of Trinitarios approach Miguel. <laughs> Because of her acting skills, no one suspected that Maria had anything to do with this. However, the incident would catch up to her later on. But for now, we remain in 2005, which ended up being a wild year for the Trinitarios. NYPD says that they're responsible for nine lives between March 11th and New Year's Day. And unfortunately, the majority of these occurred for absolutely no reason. September 5th, 2005. It's a Monday afternoon and pickup basketball is taking place at Smith Park park in Yonkers. During the game, two guys get into an argument. That would be Kayshawn Phillips and Juan Martinez, a reputed Trinitario member. Well, Martinez feels disrespected by Kayshawn and wants to prove a point, so he leaves the park and calls up three friends. He tells them to come to the park as soon as possible. They arrive and together, all four men rush Kayshawn. That's when Carlos Urena takes it too far. <laughs> 
After the incident, all of the witnesses would testify against the Trinitarios. At this point, the community had enough. All of these incidents were completely unwarranted. So in 2006, the FBI started their first investigations of the Trinitarios. Because of their lack of structure, inside information was always being leaked in the streets of New York. And as you can imagine, this made it a very easy case. In April of 2006, the FBI did a major sweep of 149 Trinitarios in New York. This was known as Operation Green Haze, one of the most successful takedowns in state history. So with 149 members gone, the Trinitario buzz would calm down for the next few years. However, the quiet streak would end on March 12, 2010. It's a Friday night in the Bronx and every hood is lit per usual. On this night, the infamous Latin Kings are hanging out on the corner of 197th and Webster in West Bronx. While a Latin King named Raymond Hernandez notices a man in lime green walking down the street. So he calls over his fellow kings and they surround a trinitario named Targelis Vargas. The kings rough him up but ultimately let him go. All they wanted to do was let him know that this is their territory. So Vargas instantly heads back to his hood looking for his friends. He finds them on the corner of Cacheo Market on Sheridan Ave. He tells them what just happened and they're all furious. So they all get in a minivan and head over to the king's territory looking for Raymond Hernandez. After an hour of searching, he's nowhere to be found, so they head back home. They decide they're going to come back on the next Friday because they're certain that the Kings will be outside. March 19th, 2010, 6 p.m. Vargas, along with three Trinitarios, are ready to roll. So they hop in a minivan and head towards 197th. They circle around the block with nothing but metal pipes in their possession. Boom! They spot Raymond Hernandez on the corner of 196. So together, the five men hop out and run towards him. Before they can get to him, his friend yells run, and Hernandez speeds away. Once the Trinitarios realize they can't catch up, they turn around on his friend. And even though his friend has nothing to do with the Kings, the Trinitarios pounce on him anyways. Orlando was a good citizen and yet another victim of the Trinitarios. The story made national news and everyone involved was arrested. And because of a lot of snitching, they took down 40 Trinitarios with them. One thing about New York is that they will get you and you will do a lot of time. And that takes us back to the infamous Maria Mea. Due to a testimony of a fellow Trinitario, she was finally held accountable for what she did in 2005. So in under a decade, 200 members were taken down and sentenced to many years. Because of these strong efforts by NYPD, crime in the Bronx plummeted. In fact, in 2012, crime was down 79% compared to 2005. But just because it's safer now does not mean the Trinitarios disappeared completely. In fact, their biggest incident would come in 2018. On June 20th, 2018, the entire country was shocked by a major incident. A young man named Lissandro Guzman Feliz, also known as Junior, lost his life. The incident occurred at 11.30 p.m. while Junior left his apartment to meet up with some friends. As he walked down the street, a group of Trinitarios got out of the car and chased him down the street. He ran inside a nearby bodega and that's where it all ended. The famous story has been covered hundreds of times but still gives you goosebumps. Junior was a good kid and not involved with the street life whatsoever. The Trinitarios had simply mistaken him for another rival. Well, after this made the news, the hashtag Justice for Junior went viral. And not too long after, 15 Trinitarios were arrested. This was the mainstream world's introduction to the Trinitarios. And that takes us to the new generation. On a positive note, some Trinitario rappers have made some noise in the past few years. You have rappers like True157, Anthony Patria, and most importantly, GB Tribuvelli. GB is from the Queens faction of the Trinitario, specifically the Lafrac Projects. In 2019, GB released songs like Seven Line Goons, Train to Go, Two Turns, and plenty more. In just a short time, he and Anthony Patria were making noise in New York City. But then, everything would come crashing down for GB. On June 4th, 2020, GB Tribavelli and his baby mother got into an argument. And sadly, his baby mother made a terrible decision. 
The incident shocked everyone. Nothing like this had ever happened before. Many believed that GB had the potential to be a big rapper. Well, outside of New York, the Trinitarios have grown to over 20,000 members worldwide. They spread to Florida, the UK, the DR, and even Spain. Police say that this began when Trinitarios began returning to the Dominican Republic. And from there, many of these people have immigrated all over the world. The more you know. Well, that's gonna do it for this episode of Swamp Stories. If you enjoyed the video, make sure to leave a like and subscribe. Peace!